a minute, then I'll turn it over to you. That works. Adrian Bush, how are you? Good morning, Steve. I'm well. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. All good. My count is six. Yes, I I miss Kevin when he signed in. Sorry about that, Kevin. <laughs> Hopefully, that worked for Brandon. The telephone number trying to join in, that might be him. Okay. That is. Hello? 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 Hello, this is, this is Brandon. Hey, Brandon, how are I'm you? I'm having issues logging in on my computer. So as I worked on that, I just called in. Um, well, I'm in the process of troubleshooting this really quick. Okay. And you have the link? Um, I couldn't find the link. So it's I emailed the uh, man. Yeah. What's your email? At? Well, you don't want to tell me your email address on here. Um, I quite often go to the persons returning to society from incarceration TAC, and there's a link on that on their webpage. Okay. See if I can do that. You may get persons returning back. Let me get you there. Okay. Let's see. And Aaron, does Brandon have to be on screen to count for the quorum? Yes. So I'm trying to also resend it from my phone as well. Hey, Steve, I'm also here. Angela Darcy, I don't know if you counted me. Yep, we count you. Glad right. you're here. Let's give Brandon a chance to get on. And then we have seven. What the... I was able to get it sent from my phone, so he should have the link now. Okay, okay. now let me see if I can go. Okay. Oh, there it is. There's the. Let's see if I can just use my phone. It'll be much easier, probably, at this rate. Um. Okay, I'm just gonna use my phone. He's gonna call in. Okay. And if you're on the tack, we need to see you, right, Aaron? Yes, their face should populate as they speak. Okay. Change. All right, very good. Does that get us to the number or not? Kevin, sure, I have Kevin. I counted seven when Brandon joined, so we should have a quorum. Super. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Appreciate your all's patience. Hey, Brandon, how are you? Well, good. Good. 
Thank you. All right, let's go ahead. I'll go slow. We all know who's on, and I'll just call off the name so people know. Uh, is James Daly on? Dr. Ryan? Dr. Smith Stevens? Brandon Harley? Yes. Hey, Brandon. Adrian Bush? Present. Evan Smith. Present. All right. Van Ingram, he may be joining us. I don't know. He had a conflict, but I think we're now at quorum. I'll tell him. And a quorum. Okay. Um, Kristen Porter. Kevin Sharkey. Present. Hey, Kevin. Angela Darcy. Sorry, present. And Brandon Thomas. All right. You have the agenda before you. We do have a quorum, correct, Aaron? Very good. Yes, sir. All right. Let's go on to... The March 10th minutes, I should have sent you the uh, December minutes. We didn't approve those. We'll do those next time. Uh, I have a motion to approve the minutes. So move this Brandon Harley. Thank you, Brandon Harley. A little worried to have a second. I'll second. Thank you, Evan Smith. All in favor, signal for saying aye. 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 Opposed and exemptions. Adopted the minutes. All right. Next item is a DMS update where we're at with our waiver. Leslie Hoffman cannot be here. Her mom, I think, was in the hospital and had some health problems. But I think Leanne Fitzpatrick's going to give us that report. Hi, good morning. Yes. Hey, Van, how are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Um, so uh, the 1115 SUD waiver update. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, September is when we plan to file that for an extension. Um, the waiver uh, ends September of 2023. So um, we plan to file the SUD waiver uh, and the SMI waiver um, this September. Uh, and then on the incarceration 1115, we're still, um, I'm not sure what uh, Leslie said last time, but we are still working on budget neutrality. And CMS had told us that this is the, we're the first state to ever submit this type of a 1115, as you all are aware as well. And so they are working on their ends of the policies making sure that everything is, is set to go. Um, we've never heard a no, it's just wait and see. <laughs> and uh, we're, st we're still working that out. So uh, fingers are still crossed. Our uh, mobile crisis grant, uh, we have the planning grant for the mobile crisis. And currently we have our needs assessment complete, but we are currently looking for peer support uh, specialist and consumers that might be willing to sit in on a small interview, small group interview or a one-on-one -on -one interview. So if you know of anyone that would be willing to sit in on that, I'll put the email in the chat and they can just reach out to me and let me know if they're peer support or a consumer and what uh, provider they work for and we will get them. We hope to have that at the end of this month. Um, and otherwise, we're still just working on updating our SPA and um, coming together with the definition of mobile crisis and the definition of behavioral health crisis. Um, and we're on track for everything that planning grant ends in September as well. So after September, we plan to work on implementation. So I will take any questions if there are any. Um. So you don't really know a time frame for the incarceration, right? Right. We ask every uh, we meet with uh, CMS every month, um, and we do ask that question. Um, and it's still just we're working on it. 
and you're still doing the other programs you had at some correctional facilities, right? Yes, the reentry program um, is still going on. We currently are not meeting monthly because we just we don't have any updates as of right now. Those meetings will um, re begin again um, soon. I'm not sure exactly on any time frame on that, but we do have the process in place for the reentry program, and it's still um, everything is still going on. Okay. Uh, related to that, I got a message from one of the CMHCs that they've had some problems with claims not being processed for folks who are coming out either local jail and they're not Medicaid eligible, but they've submitted the paperwork. Okay. So yes, when everyone is booked, they are filling out an app, a DMA, or Medicaid application and um, if they have filled that out and it just hasn't had time to be processed, if they do end up being Medicaid eligible, it will backdate to the application. Okay. And if they still have issues with claims regarding incarceration dates, please have them email me and I'll put my email in the chat at that email as well. Okay. Yeah, these are folks who have been released and you know, there's some deal they got to do with DC, DCBS, a form they got to submit, right? Yes. They, once somebody is released, they have to reach out to D, DCBS and let them know that they are released. So then they can go in and flip the switch so their suspension will be lifted. Okay. Maybe that's their problem. Well, this yes, just either, came up this week. Yes, either the person or their person's um, representative that's on file needs to contact DCBS. And that can be a phone call. Okay. Yeah. Candidly, I struggle with our agenda because it's really we're waiting on this 1115 SUD uh, waiver piece to take place. Um, and then we'll have some real people that I think will be more appropriate for us. We'll identify more issues at that point of those folks transition back. And I right. think at that point, the TAC becomes much more, uh, I don't say viable, but it, it has a more clear defined mission and charge. Right. And, and I think we've been, I guess it's going on. Is this the second year? So um, this coming November will mark three years since we have turned it in. Wow. So yeah, so when this tack was done, I would assume most folks, including Medicaid staff, right, Leanne, thought that this thing would be operational by now. And we'd have specific topics and, you know, people's experience and what can we do and, you know, and move forward from that perspective. Right. And, you know, we could still hear from experiences because that will help us when we, you know, implement. Um, yeah. We have, we have worked on steps to do after CMS says, yes, we have, um, we know what we need to do, the steps in place that we need to do. So we won't, you know, won't take time for, for that. It'll just take time for systems, of course. Um, but one of the issues we're having is currently we don't pay for that program behind the wall. So we don't no. have a lot of back history to report for budget neutral. Um, but we have talked with CMS, we have agreed on a plan of what we can do for that budget neutrality. So it's just the issue of getting it approved. And they're working with you on that budget neutrality, right? Yes, yes. That's a big challenge, 11 15th, right? It is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. you, know. you have to show that. Yeah, there's we know increases in um, charges or Medicaid dollars during the demonstration. I remember when we turned it in, we thought it might be a year. I don't think any of us thought it might. <laughs> exactly. There's the voice of Ann Ingram. I wouldn't leave you hanging. So, yeah, that's been where, you know, I think it's it's. But hopefully we hear something soon and then we move forward and have, you know. Yes. Okay. Keeping our fingers crossed. 
Any other Medicaid updates for us? That's all I have. So okay. Unless Thank anyone has any questions. Yeah, any questions? I have a question and I may have missed it, Leanne, <clears throat> but you had said that the that DMS plans to apply for the severe mental illness waiver mm -hmm. as directed by Senate Joint Resolution 72. Um, what waiver authority are, is DMS planning on using for that? It, it'll be 1115 okay. as well. Hopefully we don't get hung up on budget neutrality for three years on that. No, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, We've also been in talks with CMS with that working along along the way. So, and we also know of other states that have what what we want to do um, that that has been approved. So we um, are going to kind of follow the other states' leads as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'd like to see a residential option in that way for Adrian. Whenever that comes to pass, similar to the SCL staff residents, I think uh, I know folks at DBH. We had a call on a separate issue, and, and they have, you know, they know the people now who probably need a twenty four seven residential option, which I think makes the eleven fifteen budget neutrality challenging to get to that place because again, those that's not a cheap service. Um, and being done a couple of places, there's using state general fund dollars to do that, a three person home. So it's a model that's worked for people who are severely mentally ill. Um, I also think unique with that waiver is that it may not be the SCL waiver folks with intellectual development disabilities, they move into a staff residence and many folks stay there many, many years. But the SMI population hopefully would be more a time limited approach, you know, 12, 18 months get stabilized and then can move into their own apartment or some other option. But mm -hmm. so that's what I think we would, I know that's been my message on this waiver for first testified June of 19 before interim health, welfare, and family services. So, but anyway, appreciate the question. Right. Um, any other members have questions for Medicaid? Hey, this is Angie Darcy, and I'm with uh, Pretrial Services. So I was wondering if there is a potential that we may be able to help when people are released from custody on our side, that maybe we can start uh, notifying them that they need to notify Medicaid. Uh, because I think that has come up in the past, and and I think that it you know, to get all our people on board, but we might be able to eventually add a question or, or just inform them, uh, you know, at the time that they're incarcerated that they need to notify Medicaid when they get out. And I was just wondering if that would be something that might be helpful for you guys. That would be very helpful. Um, if okay. they hear it again, hey, you need to call DCBS. And if they call DCBS two to three days after they're released, it will go back to the release date for their benefits to be turned on. Okay, I'll uh, I'll I'll start seeing if we can get something like that rolled out. It may take a little bit of time because we have two twenty people that have to all get on board with uh, sending that message out. But I don't see why we can't, you know, assist with that at the very least. Thank you. Yeah, that will. And every time they hear it, hopefully, awesome. yeah, every time they hear that, hopefully, you know, they remember to do that. Um, but yes, that would be great. And is there an 800 number? Do they call okay. the local county DCBS office? What's the best way to contact? Um, yes, their local DCBS office. And that may be something that we can add to our resource guide is that we can put that number in our resource guide. So when they're released, they can maybe even contact, you know, if they don't know. Typically, they do know pretrial service. They can contact us. <sighs> I guess, okay. Leanne, That's there's all I get. appreciate it, Angela. It was helpful. Um, there's a, a, each DCBS county office has a different number, right? That's probably one of our challenges. Right. Right. Um, let me, I will, 
I will reach out to DCBS, uh, my contact that I work with when reentry, and um, hopefully by the end of the meeting, I'll have an, an 800 number for you. Yeah. And there are also just, I think, who is that that asked the question? Um, DCBS, Brandon Harley, uh, <clears throat> they're not back in their office, right? Correct. To my knowledge, problem? they're not. They're still working virtually. So I think the way to contact them is that 800 number, the 855 statewide number. And I'm looking, I'm on the website now trying to pull it and I'll put it, I'll post it as soon as I get it on here. And I'll put it in the chat box for everyone. Yeah, because who answers the phone at the local office? They don't anymore. What they do is it's a statewide number. It goes into call triage and then it gets sent out to you. So like say, for instance, you're calling from Pike County, you may end up getting someone from Fulton County answer the phone at that point in time. It's just they send them all throughout the state. Okay. But they all have the capability. Whoever's answering that call can go back into uh, the web portal um, to the Benefine system and get people turned back on to my knowledge. I'm going to, I'll, as soon as I find that, I will post it in the, uh, I'll post it in the, uh, the chat box. All right. Does that make sense, Leanne, that plan? Yes. Okay. Super. Other questions? All right. Thank you much. Uh, next, we have Round Robin member updates. Anybody want to provide an update, what they're working on, what they're doing? One thing the CMHCs have been involved with with Medicaid is four centers are a certified community behavioral health center, and this is a DMS, a CMS demonstration. And they get more expectations, more integration of primary care. Uh, there's that phone number, 855-306-8959. All right, does that help you, Angela? Angela Darcy? So. Yes, yeah, that's great, thanks. Okay. Uh, but those four centers, and they're trying to just starting this thing January 1, it's funded for eight quarters, so they'll do it through December 23. Uh, it has a focus on uh, got to have a mobile crisis response mechanism that Medicaid's working on. They're planning grant for that. They, you know, they're, I guess, be involved in that process. Uh, they got to have a focus on veterans, which we serve veterans today, but now it's priority population. They also get reimbursed differently. They have a prospective payment, a daily rate. So they see one person and they get paid whatever that daily rate is, regardless how many services that person may have that day or whatever the service is. So they're all the same. Uh, and the MCOs pays what they're paid normally and Medicaid makes up the difference to get to that number. Uh, eight other states started this in 16. Um, Kentucky was added just before COVID happened. So we did all our planning during COVID. Um, we made application in 16, Kentucky did. Um, and those states have seen an increase in number of people served by the CCBHCs, increase in staffing as well, and better data co collection in the process. So that's what's been going on there. And there's, um, you know, we're still trying to work out payment with MCOs. That's been a challenge but get that resolved and move forward. And in other states, it's a two years renewed. They all, they've gotten it renewed in 18 and 20 and they're still doing it. So hopefully, you know, the objective is all 14 mental health centers in Kentucky become a CCBHC and expand those services. So that's my update. Okay, let's move on to the General Assembly. Adrian, you want to give us an update on House Bill 7? Oh, no. <laughs> now, let's be honest. The final product was better than the initial, correct? Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so House Bill 7. Still not good, right? It. I mean, it's just hard when you are starting with... Um, 
a premise that people who need social safety net supports are out to defraud the government and that's where everyone is coming from, then like it's hard to get a good product if that's your foundation, in my opinion. Um, so House Bill 7 did pass. Um, it does make um, some changes to how Kentuckians access Medicaid and SNAP and keep that coverage. Um, for a detailed analysis of what changes we can expect, um, I would encourage everyone to follow Kentucky Voices for Health if you're not already, um, because they, they were on it for sure. Um, but there were some changes in terms of how folks um, self-attest to needing Medicaid um, that were done in the Senate. It did pass both chambers, the governor vetoed it, then both chambers overrode it. So it is law now. So that's, I mean, let me see. I just, I think it'll be interesting to, it's a lot of work for the cabinet still to implement. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's gonna be a big lift. <clears throat> it, um, I mean, the things that, in, the remaining concerns that we have, and this is coming from Emily Beauregard, is that it includes significant permissive language, may instead of shall, that could be interpreted very differently by a future administration um, in terms of making it harder to access these programs. Um, that permissive language could increase reporting requirements on a cabinet that is struggling with workforce capacity. I think everybody acknowledges that. Um, and it would basically create new opportunities for people who are doing all the right things to fall through the cracks. Um, it does establish new and more severe penalties for suspected fraud or misuse of benefits that don't currently have to be substantiated by the cabinet in order to take adverse action. Many people who have done nothing wrong will be caught up by inaccurate algorithms and penalized with due process. And, Okay, so like here's a real life example of something that happened to me. Um, when I was at Kroger like two months ago, I the cashier rang up like, I don't know, two thirds of my grocery. Then another cashier was trying to get her attention about, you know, something else. She like hits the point of sale, you know, it's done. Um, and rings up the total and then like there's still like a third of my groceries left to be rung up and she's like i'm so sorry about that and i'm like no big deal like just ring the rest of them up and i'll run the credit card again but like if i had been using a snap card i would have had two point of sale transactions within like a minute of each other and that would have been flagged by the cabinet's algorithm for fraud so and it wasn't anybody's fault. And it also wasn't even a big deal. Um, but anyway, that's, that's something to consider. Um, it removes the cabinet's ability to make Medicaid presumptive eligibility determinations um, and puts that, you know, only hospitals and other healthcare providers can do that. Um, it creates new barriers that could adversely impact a very needed diversion pilot program that is created by SB90, does not address provider or retailer fraud. Having spent 15 years of my life in Eastern Kentucky, I can tell you I am way more concerned about um, retailers than I am individual people. And it doesn't actually address poverty or the lack of good paying jobs across regions. And it doesn't actually improve health outcomes or reduce disparities. And again, that's what I mean by saying, if you're starting off with a flawed premise and a flawed assumption of a problem, it's really hard to get a good product out of that. 
So that is probably more than anybody wanted to know about HB7, but I do think it is important to talk about. So I thank you for the opportunity, Steve. Uh, I think it is important to talk about. I think there's going to be a lot of changes we're going to see coming up. Um, one, I know uh, state of emergency and SNAP benefits in May is going to be problematic for people. Um, right, Adrian? I mean, they're going to run. Yeah, and that's because of the separate fraud right, right, assumption right. bill. Yes. Yeah. But I think we're going to see a lot of challenges uh, for folks getting benefits. And I agree with you. Um, you know, they're not getting a ton of money. Uh, and I'm sure there's cases of fraud. I don't deny that. But it seems to be a broad brush approach to address a problem as opposed to identifying the root causes of, of, of any fraud and go from there. But I also think it's interesting. You had like no advocates. I mean, there are, there are advocates who spend their time at the Capitol, you know, like Steve, you're up there every day during session mm -hmm. and other folks, like nobody testified in favor of this bill, except for the bill's co-sponsors, but like they didn't have any citizens, any advocacy groups testifying that, they, that this was needed or wanted. And to me, that speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, any questions? Adrian mentioned Senate Bill 90. That just passed at the very end, and that really is, is, is a, a diversion model um, that we're going to get people at, at time, as, as soon as they are charged almost, to get them diverted out, do an assessment and see if they're appropriate for residential or substance use primarily, but maybe mental illness as well, but substance use services. Um, and if they participate in the program, uh, wherever they end up, you know, the services they receive, uh, those charges will eventually be dismissed. And if they don't participate, that's, you know, the stick in the carrot to get back in. But it really is, it, 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 it's the first piece of legislation I've seen in a long time that is really saying, let's not incarcerate people who have an addiction, right? Let's figure out, get them into treatment. Uh, all things we know that are effective, you know, ideally, I think a lot of the folks will be coming out of the 1115 SUD waiver um, with Senate Bill 90 never would have ended up there. Or, you know, and I think that's better across the board for everybody. Uh, you know, I've said it before, no one's looking for an employee who's been incarcerated. You know, that's not something on a job application that moves you up the list. So this is at a point, an attempt to do that. Uh, Senator Westerfield and President Stivers were kind of the force behind this piece of legislation and several reiterations, um, but prosecutors were on board. Uh, other folks, corrections, I think, were at the table. So, so I think it's, it's, it's an opportunity to see. It starts out in 10 counties and they're segmented by population. So we get a really good basis of where we're at, but hopefully uh, we have good data. And then in the fiscal year, General Assembly 24, they do the next two-year budget and they can expand it to other places. But it's 10 counties, so it's not everywhere, <clears throat> but it's a start in the process to see what happens. Yes, we Steve, know we're going to have our first meeting next week of the state agencies that are involved in AOC, um, Medicaid and behavioral health and my office and others. The best thing that happened was at the last minute, um, they put $10.5 million in a pot to get this started. Yeah. Um, because we were really struggling with how are we going to pay for assessments for folks that aren't Medicaid eligible. Uh, but I, I think now we've got a, a fallback plan. Uh, but I think I, there will be some involvement with Medicaid dollars as well. Um, so we look forward to that. Um, we're going to be dependent on our, our, our CMHCs to, to be involved uh, at the local level. I think they're, they'll be a great asset to the program. Uh, so. We have to get it ready by January 1st, 2023, uh, which may seem like a long time off, but in state government time, it's that's right up, coming right up on us. Uh, so uh, uh, we're mm -hmm. going to get to work on it next week. Good deal. Good to hear. Thanks, man. Any other legislation folks want to talk about? All right. 
And next, I well, I had one quick question. What do we know? What ten counties that started in, or the no? They're segmented out. That's a great question by population. So they have small to large counties, but they have not identified. They opted initially; they were going to have the counties in the bill, then they decided not to be. If something didn't happen in the county, they couldn't go someplace else. So they have not identified those counties yet. Um, Van, I guess that's going to be on your all's agenda, right? It is, uh, and and AOC has the responsibility of identifying those those counties, um, and I think they've got a got a short list. Now, it's, it, it, we don't have to stop at 10. The, the right. legislation does a minimum of 10. So right. uh, if, if there are counties that show a lot of interest above 10, I think we ought to take a look at that. But the bill does, they have some breakdown by population though, right? Yes. Yeah. So again, this isn't just going to be Jefferson County, Fayette County. You know, they're going to try to get... And part of that was to get good data to go forward. I mean, they're really trying to position themselves to, to, to show the, the outcome of this <coughs> and how it plays out and then uh, expand it afterwards, you know. And that's always my fear with pilot programs, you know. A lot of pilot programs, but, you know, at some point I want to get passengers, not just a pilot on that plane. So, but yeah, I think it's exciting. Good piece of work. So let's add Senate Bill 90 to our agenda. Is that okay, Van? You give us updates on that regularly? Love to. Okay. And over time, we'll pay attention to House Bill 7 and what we're hearing about that. So we have some data as well. So, you know, just even if it's anecdotal, so we can maybe help Medicaid figure out a way to move that forward. Because it's the law, right, Adrian? Got to figure out how to make it work now. Any other topics? All right. Our next meeting is July 14th. That's my steel day. Something? Yeah, go ahead. And I don't know where my face went, so if everybody can hear me okay. I was trying to turn my camera back on. So I want to discuss the possibility of coming back to in-person meetings. Um, let me see if I can find my... There we go. So as you can see, I'm in our conference room here. Um, this is Commissioner's Conference Room. We've got the new equipment up and running. Let's see if I can zoom in. So with being on camera, open records and having a quorum, we would need to fit, um, you know, this side. If I zoom back, we can get most of the table. So I've been starting putting on the tax radars on whether or not they want to come back in person versus um, virtual. I have had a lot of discussions with hybrid uh, meetings, with being open meetings, anyone who wants to attend, um, we have to offer that. So there would always be a Zoom link still. I don't know how many of you live in Frankfurt, live close, you would have to travel. Um, as you could tell, we can only fit X amount of people in. Of course, I, I'm not important, I can always hide in the corner. Um, so we have the option of logging in, coming in person. I know you guys are one of the larger TACs with 12 members. Yeah. Um, so it's just there for discussion. I don't know if that's something you guys want to put on your next uh, meeting agenda, if you want to discuss that now and take votes since you, I don't think you have to have a quorum to vote for that, but since you have one, it might be best to go ahead and discuss. Yeah. Um, everyone's thoughts. And then if you don't get a consensus, maybe put it back on next month's or next meeting's agenda, excuse me. Yeah. And we could do it meeting by meeting for a while, but that room could not accommodate all 12. We'd be real close. Um, we okay. could probably fit all 12 board members in 
uh, and then the MCOs and anyone from the public could always log in hybrid or um, okay. I don't know, like I said, if any of you guys travel several hours away, you may prefer to, to not have to drive several hours for the meeting. I know in some of the other tax, we have people that when they were driving, they're you know, three and a half hours away. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, that's a lot of drive time. So I'm just kind of putting that on the radar to discuss. And, and I've got it zoomed out as far and I, I find the one squeaky chair. So I apologize. So but as you can tell, we could probably fit 12 of you around, but you, you have to be real friendly and close with each other. So. <laughs> Anybody have an opinion? Thought about that in person? Zoom? You know, I, I would prefer that hybrid option. Um, had I been in Frankfurt today, I would have definitely come over to CHFS. Um, but I'm in Barberville and this, <clears throat> by having this option, I could participate um, where I wouldn't be able to if this link wasn't available. I agree with the van on that piece. This is Brandon Harley. Um, you know, for me to go, it'd be a two and a half hour drive for me to come in for the meeting from in from, uh, you know, in from the other side of Owensboro. But I mean, I can do it from time to time, but I think the hybrid option would be your best option. Other Brandon? I, I agree. Hybrid. Um, I'm in Ashland, so, you know, it'd take me around two hours to get there. And once again, I don't mind, but there are times that I have other meetings and have to be other places as well. And it's just not, I'm just not capable of making that to there sometime. But a lot of times I'll be able to make it. <clears throat> Yeah, and yeah, I certainly think there's a critical mass of us for which the travel is, um, would, you know, would be burdensome. And so to me, the real question is, um, is it really worth, you know, taking the time of all the staff in Frankfurt to really set up an in-person option if, you know, there might only be a couple people actually there in person? Um, again, I think we'll kind of see how things go, and I certainly wouldn't, you know, want to discourage anyone from getting together in Frankfurt who might want to but I can at least speak personally that again, for me, it's over a two hour drive. And so it, it would just turn into a, an all day thing. Well, what we can do is we can continue with the hybrid moving forward. And if um, it comes to the point where they have changed the rules and we have to come back in person, we can cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, if anybody is going to be in Frankfurt and they know that they would like to join me, if you could just let me know a few days ahead of time so I can let the security desk know. Um, and also so I can come down and greet you and bring you up to the uh, conference room so they don't just send you through our Medicaid maze up here on the sixth floor at CHS. <laughs> Guess another question, Steve. Do we like, as a group for this, do we like have an annual meeting or a, you know, a fiscal year meeting? So, you know, this is our annual return i mean i guess what i'm asking is are there specific meetings that in person would be a better option or we have to or we set a certain amount that says in person would be preferable or something like, i mean that's another piece to consider as well so not that i'm aware of and eric could probably answer better but you know the, the tax just and i've served on the behavioral health tax i don't know how many years since it got started uh but there's no you know there's, there's no formal process we have to do annually. We got to convene. It's not like some boards of directors where you have to meet at least, you know, and have an annual meeting. Um, so that piece doesn't necessarily take place. Uh, so, and, and, and even, we used to meet at the annex a lot for the behavioral health tax uh, in terms of space. <clears throat> and, but uh, I think the hybrid makes the most sense. Um, I think there's there's um, some value to meeting in person. You know, at some point, I realize it's problematic. It's a long way. Brandon, for you, for example, the meeting starts at 8. I mean, you're heading out of your house probably at 5.15, 5.30 a.m., which, you know, isn't the end of the world, you know, but still, you'd prefer not to do that if, if, if you clearly could. Um, uh, so, so I think the hybrid makes the most sense. And then that allows people who, who have other things going on locally can, you know, attend those as well. So that's where my take it would be is to move forward. And I think you're right, Aaron, at some point there's going to be, I mean, could be some message that they has to, you know, must meet in person. Uh, but if that's the case, then you're still going to have a conference room wouldn't accommodate 
we had 17, 18 people on at one time, mm -hmm. right? We have 31 participants currently. So 31. I know 31 of us won't fit in here comfortably. Yeah. I mean, we could all stand around maybe, but that wouldn't be a very fun meeting. <laughs> no. But so I think, you know, I agree with the group in person. Now, um, I mean, hybrid model. I may plan myself to attend in person, but that's, you know, my own personal preference. Adrian, you're in Frankfurt, right? Yeah, I'm on Main Street. Yeah. I'm just down the street. So I am <clears throat> I am comfortable um, having a hybrid model because one of the things I want to keep moving forward is the accessibility. Yeah. Um, and so, but yeah, if there were an in-person option, I would probably show up, but I would give you a heads up, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> Good topic. Appreciate that, Aaron. No problem. So hybrid it is. You know, I part. I just zoomed into the primary care tech. They went to the same place, right, Aaron? They did. You know, behavioral health tech meets this afternoon. I think it's going to be probably the same. You know, I I believe so. I think if I had to guess, I would say for the most part, while it's still available people are going to take advantage of that, especially some of the larger tax and some of the ones that have several members that drive, yeah. um, you know, multiple hours. And um, so I think a lot of them will continue to um, probably stay hybrid would be my guess. Okay. All right. Any other items? Our next meeting, July 14th, again, that will be hybrid. So if people want to go to Frankfurt, they're welcome to do that, 9 a.m. Um, and, and you see the other September, November for the rest of this year. That's all I have, folks. Any other questions, topics? Appreciate you all. Looking forward to the 1115 being approved and we can move forward. All right, y'all have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great afternoon. Greetings.